now to the story that of of course has dominated the headlines all week. The rise and the fall of the European Super League. Darren, Gary Neville uh, called it the attempted murder of English football, which I thought was quite a good phrase. Have you known a week like it? Can you believe, I think is my, probably one of my questions, is you can believe that the idea got that far? Yes, I can, because they've been trying to do something in some way, shape or form for the best part of two decades now. Don't forget, we're only, what, six months or so on from Project Big Picture. Mm -hmm. The big clubs have been wanting in some way to find a way to maximise their revenue and to increase it. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of triumphalism around English football at the moment because the, spa the, the, the fans have spoken. The fans have made it very clear mm -hmm. where they stand on this and Gary has spoken superbly well throughout the yeah. whole week. But I want to point you to the Spanish media yesterday. Florentino Perez gave an interview to the Spanish Daily Ass where he said, this is not dead, this will be back. Mm -hmm. Juan Laporta backed him as well. The Italian clubs are alongside this. In fact, I'll read you uh, some of what he said. He said, look, the fact is some clubs can't leave because of the pressure. They've had to say they'll leave, but this project or something very similar will happen. And I hope it's in the near future. That's Perez yesterday. Now, you bear in mind Perez's stock in trade is collecting the best of the best. He's done it at Real Madrid for quite some time now. The Galacticos, that's what he does. Mm. Um, so he clearly is hell-bent on driving this through in some way, shape or form. And I've got no doubt they'll try again in a couple of years' time. And that's why so many players, sorry, so many fans don't believe the apologies. They don't believe the words that have come from the people who've run the club. There's been a lot of anger. You know, some clubs are being accused of not apologising. When they do, people say, stuff your apology. There's a lot of emotion this week. Yeah. Fans don't want to hear it, basically. They're sick to the back teeth of being manipulated, patronised, lied to, and understandably so, because these are guys who have come in with no real feeling for football and have literally try to leverage the clubs that they have ownership of so that they can make money. They hardly ever go to games with the exception of likes of say Roman Abramovich. Mm. Um, and they are guys who have left a lot of people disillusioned with the game. There is some excellent writing it, it, and has been throughout the week. Martin Samuel in the Daily Mail yesterday talked about the fact that Arsenal, they think they're better than the teams, most of the teams outside of the top six, but they don't want to have to prove it. And it's not just us, all of that big six, they don't want to have to prove it. And if you look at the pattern of the games this week, Arsenal needing a late goal to get a point off Fulham, Liverpool dropping points against Leeds, and again yesterday against Newcastle, time and again throughout the season, smaller clubs giving the bigger clubs a bloody nose. That's the essence of competition in this mm. country that they don't want to have. Terrific piece by Jonathan Northcroft in the Sunday Times today with the background and the fact that Jordan Henderson it effectively risked his space. He, he said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest, I don't want it. And he's made sure he told the FSG president, Mike Gordon, about his feelings and he relayed those to the club, Jurgen Klopp, and all of the managers and players who are forced into the front line to defend mm. something they knew yeah, nothing about. Yeah. They've been fantastic all the way through. Mm. And Ollie Holt done a terrific piece. Andy done another great piece as well. Everyone basically bringing their influence and experience to bear about uh, to articulate for the fans that this is not something they want and when it comes again the fans will rise up I have no doubt and fight it again I think this has still got some way to go yeah that, that was right I thought Gary Neville spoke superbly about it really educated about it as well and spoke you know when he's making his passionate points he's getting his points across really well how can the players not know about it and then they expect the managers to come out and deal with it that apology it, how they, would you have felt if you're a current player i don't felt you yeah might have been playing the euros suddenly and then all of a sudden i'm not playing because my club have like basically not mentioned anything to my manager our manager hasn't related it to the players players and fans are the most important people at football club i know owners are feel they are because they run the football club i totally get that 
without fans or players, you can't have a football club. So I don't understand how you can. That's why I think Darren's spot on with um, what Jordan um, Jordan Henderson's come out and said. And it weren't just Jordan Henderson. No. There was other players: Luke Shaw, James Milner, Patrick Bamford, Marcus Rashford. The list goes on and on. It's just pure greed. What? And I, you know what made it? What happens to the lower league clubs then if, if this had happened? That's what I wanted to ask you, Daz, because I coach at grassroots level. What happens to the grassroots? Because I still don't think enough money is filtered down for those kind of players I um, go to at grassroots. Team, but I will just say this one thing. I spoke to West Ham's Mark Noble this week. And Mark Noble said something very interesting. He said, you know what? The, the, the collective power of the captains in the Premier League is something that should be replicated in the championship in League One, in League Two, because mm. without the players, none of this exists. Without exactly. them being lucky enough to play, without them being lucky enough to have that ability, this whole ecosystem doesn't exist. And they now realise they can use their collective power for racism, for other social issues, as well as this, because the players are not listened to enough. And hopefully now, people will realise they have a really the, powerful voice. Yeah. And we are, I know we're getting to David, I know we are, definitely, but this is a point I made yesterday on Soccer Saturday, and I need to make this point now. Let me tell you something. You see all the energy that I've seen from the people like UEFA, FIFA, stuff, tackling this Euro Super League and everyone else talking about it, people from government get involved. Get involved in this to tackle racism and online abuse, because you show all this energy when it comes to money and stuff like that in the Super League. It's nowhere near as big as racism. So show that energy, which everyone did in that, in stopping that to stop racism and then everyone will be a lot happier because that is the one thing that burns me massively. I see so much people with loads of energy for this, which is right. We don't want football re ruined and the football fans got together, but show that for online abuse and racism, please, because everyone will be a lot happier and it can be done. And that's all. I, I, that's the big thing I wanted to say. I said it yesterday and I'll say it today and I'll keep speaking. And I'm telling you, it's something I'm passionate about. Please show that energy because everyone showed that energy to stop the Super League and it's nowhere near as big as tackling online abuse and racism. So that's, that's me. Thank you, Clint. No worries. Couldn't agree more. OK, let's get more on this then. And as you said, both said, uh, David Ornstein is waiting to talk to us uh, from the Athletics. So good morning to you, David. Let's start with Arsenal. Fans protested before Friday's night's defeat to Everton. How much pressure do you feel the board is now under? Well, morning, guys. And can we just take a moment to thank Clinton for his words there? Because that was incredibly powerful. And I don't think we should let this subject slip because racism is far more important than this money grabbing Super Leagues, call it what you like. Uh, in terms of the Arsenal situation, yeah, that was incredibly toxic, wasn't it? The scenes we saw outside the Emirates Stadium and fair play to the fans for voicing their views. Uh, it sent a powerful image around the world. Uh, <laughs> It's even brought a, a potential investor to the table who, who <laughs> may want to buy out the Kroenke family. Um, and if there was any goodwill towards the ownership previously, then that appears to have extinguished, although I don't think it will affect their views on owning the club. And I'm sure that's something we'll come on to speak about. This has stung people at Arsenal incredibly badly because Arsenal and other clubs can say they were late to the party, they didn't want to miss out, they weren't the authors of this project. But you could also say that that's quite a cowardly thing to do, that you're a sheep, you're just following the others, but at the same cost to the game and the fans. There was quite a lot of good sentiment involved or, or good detail involved in this Super League proposal, potentially, but we didn't even get to hear it because it was so shambolically launched that Nobody even explained the detail of the Super League. Uh, the PR effort was disastrous. There are problems in the game that need to be resolved, whether it's via UEFA or somebody else when it comes to the, the European structure. Uh, I think there was extreme arrogance on behalf of the clubs, and Darren touched upon it there with recent results. Most of the clubs involved in this Super League are not even that prominent at the moment in terms of footballing success. Uh, and that really hurt a lot of people, the closed shop. Um, but yeah, I'm getting away from the point. I'm getting emotional as well because um, this was an ill-conceived project that I do think will come back round in various iterations uh, because it's, it's been bubbling for so many years. Let's not just think it's going to go away. When Josh Kroenke, the Arsenal director, son of the owner, Stan, spoke to the fans the other night, uh, he said that they're not continuing with this constructed version. It doesn't mean that they won't look to do something in the future, but he did promise if anything is considered, they will discuss it and consult with the fans in the future. 
Well, it's exactly what I was going to ask you, because, of course, he attended, didn't he, Josh Cronkey, this fans forum on Friday. Did that surprise you? Do you feel that they are willing to listen? Yeah, I do. And people can criticise me for saying that and say he's been here for long enough and his family have been in charge of Arsenal um, for quite some years now and they haven't listened until this point. Um, I've been able to interview Josh Kroenke in the past and um, I do think he has the best interests of Arsenal at heart and he wants to play a more active role in proceedings. He was a more regular visitor uh, around the time of Arsene Wenger's departure in 2018, Unai Emery's appointment, Unai Emery's sacking, Mikel Arteta's appointment and then the pandemic hit and, and he and his father have not been able to get over it since then. As some people have pointed out, you could easily jump on Zoom calls with the fans. You've been able to jump on enough Zoom calls um, with the other clubs who have been plotting this European Super League and he stated very clearly that he will, uh, this is almost like a watershed moment, he will now uh, interact with the fans more going forward. Um, it's not for me to say whether that's going to happen or not. The proof will be in the pudding and it can only be a good thing if the fans are going to have a greater voice at Arsenal and every other club that have been involved in this and those that haven't been involved in this too. The fans need to p play a, a greater role in the football conversation. Uh, David, Josh and Stan Kroenke have a problem. The performance on the pitch is really poor. The club has regressed. They could be knocked out of the Europa League by the guy they sacked uh, to bring in Mikel Arteta. The fans, do you think they'll be appeased by Josh's words? And also, do you think Stan is considering selling the club at all? We know that the Spotify founder, Daniel Eyck, threw his hat into the ring to buy the club. Is that on the cards, in your opinion? Well, your first question was about whether the fans will be appe appeased, Darren, and no, I don't think they will. Um, as somebody involved at a high level on the football side, uh, uh, one of the other um, proposed Super League clubs said to me at the end of last week, this will all come down to results on the pitch, which you may interpret as a pretty crass view, and I know it's a lot wider than that, but we also know how fickle we all are as fans in that when our team is winning, things are good and Arsenal have a chance to salvage their season by winning the Europa League, which would uh, secure them entry really out of the blue back into the Champions League, which has been their aim for quite a few years now. And that would make them very happy if they can finish the season strongly. It won't get away from these issues. And for many people, there, there's no going back. There was no bridge to be burned, but whatever there was, that, that has all gone and, and they want to change in ownership. Um, the Cronky family are very thick-skinned. Uh, they and we've written about this in a big piece about the Cronkies on the Athletic a few months ago. They tend to don a rhinoceros hide, and when criticism comes in, um, they they put this shell on, and they're, and they're resistant to it. It doesn't affect them. You should see some of the media coverage of Stan Cronky in the USA. Of course, he moved um, his American football team to a completely different city, and he was sharply criticised for that. Um, but they've never sold, to my knowledge, any of their sporting franchises. And Arsenal are said to be the dual jewel in the crown uh, alongside the LA Rams. And therefore, there would be no intention, which Josh Kroenke stated on the um, call the other night with fans, that they're not going anywhere. They plan to be the owners of Arsenal and invest, he said, for a long time to come. So there is this interest as reported, well, it was on social media, um, Mr. Eck, and then also in the Telegraph yesterday and into this morning, it's been reported that his interest is not just a PR stunt, it's credible, but it did also say in there that his wealth and, and the figure of it would dictate that he might need, you know, to go in with somebody else. And therefore, I don't think that's going to even cross the brow of the Kroenke family. Um, I remember reporting a few years ago, it was a Saturday night and there was a huge story in the Telegraph about a Middle Eastern proposed takeover of Arsenal. That was when the Cronkies were only part owners with Alicia Usmanov and that got brushed aside. Since then they've become full owners and they're not going anywhere. It would take something astronomical, I'm sure, to for them to consider selling. We've seen those figures mentioned in the press this morning about Manchester United and Liverpool rejecting or being of interest for a takeover. Um, but as I said, the Cronkies are not sellers. They're long-term investors in all of their sports franchises. And in the piece that we did on The Athletic that, that I mentioned previously, we detail their background in sports ownership, and that will give you everything you need to suggest that this criticism 
It will not be water off a duck's back. They will feel it keenly, but they will plow on with their project. I've got no doubt about that. Ed Woodward has obviously gone. Where do Man United go from here? And could his departure affect Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's transfer plans? Clinton, that's a, a, a huge story. Ed Woodward has been at the centre of what Manchester United have been doing for so long now. Um, and it's our understanding at The Athletic that there's a good chance that he will not leave at the end of the year, which is what it said in the statement, but at the end of the season, in the summer. Um, there's been some conjecture around his role in this proposed Super League. After his departure was announced, it seemed to be briefed to various parts of the media that he was never in favour of this Super League, but we know that he was heavily involved in it. Whether that was on behalf of his club or whether that was his own views, he did address the players on Monday and he was lobbying in favour of the Super League. So I think we need to treat some of those suggestions with, with caution. But him leaving is a huge moment. What are Manchester United going to do next? Well, they've got Richard Arnold there, the managing director. Could they look for continuity? And could Joel Glazer, who's the key man in terms of the ownership's running of Manchester United, turn to Richard Arnold for continuity? Or could he look outside to a new chief executive, a slightly new structure? Um, we've also heard that Ed Woodward has sort of suggested to people that he will be involved in the appointment of his successor, which will certainly divide opinion. And we don't know how the Glazer family, who have been so close to him for so long, will feel about that. As for your point on Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and transfers, now I don't think it's going to affect the plan. Manchester United will have had their plans for the summer and I don't think Ed Woodward leaving will affect them majorly. I think some people might point out how difficult negotiations have been with Manchester United and, and Ed Woodward. And, and so maybe it will be improved for United this summer. Of course, Matt Judge is the man who leads the negotiations on behalf of the club. I think the budgets will be pretty much the same, even though they might have been expecting a lot more money if they had joined the Super League for transfers. Uh, but I think as we've discussed for a while now, you know, their, their, their hopes to bring in a striker, a centre half, maybe some other positions as as well like cover it right back and depending on whether players leave what will be coming in uh, I don't really think this whole situation is massively affected by Ed Woodward's departure John Murta has come into a role there as well a new role there which uh, is involved in recruitment and um, and I think it will will continue so um, an, an, an interesting summer ahead for Manchester United that's for sure Finally, we discussed it at length and you said, you know, what an impassioned speech there was from Clinton because obviously yeah. sanctions don't really appear for racism in football. So I'm guessing, realistically, any sanctions for the six Premier League clubs, will they get anything for this? Well, there must be sanctions for the racism now, Vicky. I mean, or, or tougher sanctions. Um, Alexander Cheferin, in an interview with Rob Draper in the, in the Mail on Sunday today, has kind of insinuated that football now needs to show this collective effort that they've shown around the Super League when it comes to racism. And he's in a privileged position to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, zero tolerance on racism. We're not seeing it and we need to. This social media uh, boycott um, will hopefully be a start. It's a step in the right direction, but I don't think that's going to put off the racists. What it might do is send a message to the social media companies that you need to do more at playing your part. But let's not uh, get away from the fact that we need to get our own house in order in society, not just on the social media side of things. As for punishments for those uh, Super League clubs... Uh, Shefferin says there will be punishments at UEFA level. I'm told the Premier League um, want some kind of punishment for those involved. But what form will that take? You, you punish with points or a fine. It could affect the fans and the, and the transfer hopes, uh, their position in the league table. You're punishing the players and the staff who weren't involved and the fans who weren't involved in this at all. How do you punish the executives? Take them off of Premier League committees? Well, I don't think that's going to affect their careers, but maybe it's necessary... All the same, and from a corporate governance point of view, you can't have people sitting on these committees that have essentially plotted against the Premier League. From what I hear of the Premier League, they don't want the phrase Big Six talked about within Premier League circles anymore. That is done with, and these are clubs who should be recognised as, as trying to form this uh, European Super League. But the clubs are needed for the Premier League. They are the fabric, part of the fabric of this competition. And so we need to repair relationships. We need to calm down. And with time, hopefully, uh, there will be recovery. Um, but yeah, I think punishments in some form is certainly something being considered uh, by the Premier League and by the governing body of European football, UEFA. OK, brilliant stuff, as always. Thank you so much, David.
Dan, you wanted to speak, didn't you? Then? Yeah, just very quickly. I think yeah. that we need to have a little bit of self-awareness in this country. You know, we're talking about points deductions and getting angry with all of the clubs and, you know, that the, the authorities here, not UEFA, here, you know, look at us saying what should happen to these big clubs when we never did that about racism. It keeps coming back to that subject. We are accusing UEFA of lacking the energy to fight racism. We lack it in this country because if we had it in this country, we would have threatened all these things for clubs whose players were racist or clubs whose fans were racially abusive in this country. And we lack the self-awareness to accept that when we talk about these huge fan, huge fines for over the Super League. It's not just UEFA who's tone deaf. The other thing is, Chefferin, I spoke to him myself, and Chefferin said we can still throw players out of big UEFA competitions. Let's hold his feet to the fire on that. Let's not wonder what he could do. He said those words. Let's hold him to that, because if we could do that, that's another real thing we can do. Let's stop talking, and let's start putting the people who can make decisions under pressure to make those decisions.